Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk in this uh, fantastic forum. I, I, I'm sure we will see along the next days very uh, interesting examples on how the scattering techniques uh, are excellent tools to understand the structure of food. And in my case, I would like to, to show you some examples of the work that we have been doing on the investigation of the structure of uh, polysaccharide gels. So first of all, uh, a little bit of my background. I'm currently working uh, for the Spanish Council for Scientific Research, the CSIC. Um, it has several institutes uh, along uh, Spain, uh, and I was previously working on Valencia on the extraction of polysaccharides from marine biomass and the development of gel-like structures, but I'm currently based on, on Madrid, on a different institute. But it was several years ago uh, when I was working in Australia with Elliot Gilbert and Mike Kidley that I had the opportunity of learning how uh, excellent tools are the scattering techniques to, to understand the structure of food. So first of all, why are we interested uh, in understanding the structure of food? Well, uh, for scientific and for technological reasons, because you know, uh, nowadays the, the consumers are looking for, for new types of foods like uh, functional foods or dietetic foods. So we need to develop uh, new production processes. But also the consumers are more and more concerned about the relationship between diet and health. So we want to understand also how the foods that we are consuming are affecting our health. So as you know, uh, food has uh, many foods have a very complex structure. Uh, the polysaccharides, proteins, are, and fats are the main macronutrients. And today I will talk to you uh, about polysaccharides. So one example of polysaccharides I'm sure you know is cellulose we can find in the cell walls from uh, vegetables and fruits. Uh, but in general, polysaccharides are uh, the major components in fruit and vegetables. Uh, they can account up to 90% of the dry weight. And they are also used in the food industry as ingredients because they, they have thickening, gelling properties. They, they can also be used as encapsulants uh, and some other functionalities. And there are some examples here uh, from the most widely known polysaccharides, which can be extracted from plants, seaweed, and can also be produced from microorganisms. And uh, some par particularities uh, from polysaccharides in foods is that they are typically found in nature as highly hydrated systems. And this is an issue because um, typically microscopy techniques have been used to, to investigate the structure of these polysaccharides. Uh, but since we need to subject the samples to drying processes, we are surely affecting the structure of these uh, native uh, materials. And then on the other hand, uh, we can find polysaccharides uh, uh, having an amorphous structure, such as some uh, phycocolloids, which are water soluble but they can also be uh, showing a crystalline structure such as cellulose. And also another important particularity of polysaccharides is that uh, most of them or some of them uh, are able to form gels uh, when they are subjected to uh, different temperature conditions. So many of you, I'm sure you are familiar with these gel-like structures in gelatins and products like that. And here I'm showing an example of uh, based on the work that I did in Australia to investigate the structure of uh, cellulose. And as you can see, um, we can find cellulose in the plant cell walls uh, forming a hierarchical structure with different structural levels. So we need to combine different uh, characterization techniques to, head, to get the, the whole picture. And in this sense, scattering techniques are very powerful uh, because not only they allow us to cover almost the whole uh, size range of interest, but we can also analyze the structure of these materials in their nat native hydrated state. So that's a very great advantage. 
And I would look also like to mention, because you will see in my presentation that uh, we used X-rays and neutrons. And that's because in the case of polysaccharides, X-rays are going to highlight differences between crystalline and amorphous domains. Whereas when using neutrons, we can uh, generate contrast between different uh, components in, in our samples. So uh, we need to be careful of selecting the source of radiation that, that we need for each type of experiment. And you will see in, in the results uh, that I will show you today, uh, some experiments that we did on, in Australia using the SANS and USANS instrument. But we have also done a lot of work um, in the sax and wax line in the Spanish synchrotron. So the first example uh, consists on agar-based hydrogels. So agar is a polysaccharide which is uh, found on the cell walls uh, from red seaweeds. I'm sure uh, you are familiar with agar agar because nowadays it, it, it's commercialized and uh, it's used in the food industry to produce gel-like uh, products. So in this case, uh, what we wanted to explore was to how to uh, simplify the, the production process of, of the agar because it's a relatively complex uh, process uh, industrially. It has several steps. The main ones uh, are uh, an alkali per treatment, uh, where we are removing some other polysaccharides which are present in the seaweed and other components. And then the main extraction step is a hot water treatment. So uh, we wanted to uh, investigate the possibility of removing the first alkali uh, extraction step. And then also evaluate the possibility of using um, alternative uh, methods such as uh, ultrasounds to extract agar. So first thing we observe is that the, the sonication extraction allowed us to reduce the extraction time significantly while the extraction yields were preserved. And then, uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, we produced less purified agars by skipping this first alkali treatment which is, of course contains some other components such as proteins and minerals. So the alkali pretreatment is good when we want to produce uh, pure agars, but on the other hand is producing a lower molecular weight agars. And then the non-purified extracts contain agar, but some other con components such as proteins, minerals and polyphenols, which gave them some uh, bioactive properties. And therefore, we wanted to study what was the gelation process in the pure agars and the, in the less purified agars. So the hypothesis was that uh, when in solution, uh, agar chains are forming a random coil uh, structure. And then as we cool down, they first uh, form the, the helix aggregates which then uh, associate to form bundles. And these bundles are responsible for the hydrogel structure. So we first started doing some rheological measurements. And uh, here you can see the results from a more purified agar versus a uh, less purified agar. And essentially, um, you see that the, the gelation temperature was very similar for both of them. So that means even if we have some impurities, they are not affecting the, the, the gel structure, the final gel structure, but they are forming softer gels. And on the other hand, when, uh, when heating down the samples back to the initial temperature, there was no real melting. So the structures that were being formed were not completely disrupted. And there was a large synergesis, meaning that uh, there was a large difference between the initial status and the, and the final uh, structure of the material. So now we wanted to understand what was going on on, on these agars. And uh, for that, the first thing we, do, we did was to perform a sax and sans uh, experiments on the gels as they were formed. And in the case of uh, using neutrons, we took advantage of contrast variation so that uh, you can see there uh, the type of cells that we used. Uh, we put a piece of the, of the gel sample and then it was soaked on different uh, mixtures of 
H2O and D2O, so that to generate different contrasts. And as you can see uh, here in, in the scattering patterns from, from the SACS and SANS experiments, uh, we, we can differentiate three regions, a low Q region where most of the samples show the power law behavior, then an intermediate region uh, where uh, most of the samples showed a uh, shoulder-like feature and then uh, incoherent uh, scattering. So uh, using advantage of taking advantage of the, of the contrast variation experiments, uh, what we did was uh, to plot the intensity values calculated at, at a certain Q value versus the amount of D2O in our solvent to determine the, the contrast match point of the samples. And uh, if you are familiar with, with SANS techniques, uh, you will know that uh, if the samples are uh, not deviating from the theoretical behavior, those points would fit to pa a parabolic function. And then we would have a minimum point, which uh, theoretically would give us a, an intensity of zero, and that's the contrast match point. That means that the scattering length density of the sample equals that of the solvent. But as you can see um, in, in this plot, most of the samples deviated from, from that behavior and that was something that was not unexpected uh, to us because we knew that um, this polysaccharide, well, it's not something particular from agar, from agar. We also saw that something similar in the case of cellulose because they have so many uh, labile uh, hydroxyl groups they are exchanged when we soak the pellicles in different uh, solvent mixtures. So there, there will be a deviation from, from the theoretical behavior. And in fact, as you can see, uh, the theoretical scattering length density of agaros was 2.16, while for most of our samples, we obtain higher values. And this was especially visible in the case of the less purified samples. This could be due to a different structure for the R, but also uh, due to the presence of other components, such as the proteins. And then on the other hand, when uh, fitting our scattering data using uh, an, empirical, an empirical model, we observed that the radius of gyration, which is related to the thickness of the, of the agar double helixes, uh, was uh, greater in the case of the more purified agar. So that that made us think that probably uh, if we have a higher concentration of, of agarose in those samples, they were forming thicker bundles. And finally, to also understand the gelation process, uh, we took advantage uh, of uh, the synchrotron beamline and uh, performed a temperature result uh, SACS experiments. So we used a similar program to, to that uh, we previously used for, for rheological measurements. And the samples were uh, heated to 95 degrees to melt uh, the gels. And then uh, they were kept at that temperature for 30 minutes and cooled down back to 25 degrees. So uh, we observed that there was a no melting uh, transition in the samples, but there was a disruption in the structure of the aggregates because the, the shoulder uh, disappeared when we were heating the samples. That was true in the case of the less purified samples. But as you can see here, for a more purified agar, uh, even when we increase the temperature, there was little change on the, on the scattering intensity. So that made us think that uh, in that case, the, the, um, the helix aggregates were much more stable. And then on the other hand, when cooling down uh, the sample back to the initial temperature, we, will not, we were not able to recover the initial structure. So this process was not completely reversible. So based on this, on, on all of these results, we proposed a gelation mechanism for the purified agars and for the less purified agars. As you can see, uh, in the case of the purified agars, we have a two-step a gelation process. Uh, first, the agar chains combine to form double helices, and then these helices further aggregate to form the bundles with a size uh, around 7 to 10 nanometers. And these bundles, as I said before, they are responsible for the, the hydrogel structure. 
And then in the case of the less purified agars, we have proteins and other components which are not impeding the formation of the uh, agar double helices, uh, which then further aggregate into bundles, but the size of these bundles uh, is uh, smaller. So that's the reason why we observe a um, lower uh, strength for the, for the less purified agar hydrogels. But in any case, we saw that the presence of the proteins did not impair the interconnectivity of the gel network. So now another example, uh, a different polysaccharide, which is carraginan. Uh, this polysaccharide is also found in the cell walls from red seaweed. And in this case, uh, we have different types of carraginans depending on the amount and the position of sulfate groups. Here you can see that we work with kappa carraginan, which has only one sulfate group per disaccharide unit, while yota carraginan contains two sulfate groups. So um, this uh, position and amount of sulfate groups uh, has a strong impact on the type of, of gels that are formed. Uh, while in the case of kappa carraginan, we typically can form very strong gels. In the case of yota carraginan, they are softer gels, more like a paste consistency. So in this case, uh, we started doing a, a design of experiments uh, where we were modifying the type and concentration of carraginan. And then we also studied the incorporation of two different salts, uh, the valent salt containing calcium, a monovalent salt containing uh, potassium. Uh, so to investigate the, the influence of these two salts in the, in the type of hydrogel that was being formed. So what we saw is that the carraginan and salt concentration had a very strong impact on the hydrogel strength. And as you can see, those were the optimal conditions for each type of carraginan. Um, even with the addition of salt, in the case of the yota carraginan, you see that the strength, the hydrogel strength was much lower. And that's because the sulfate content was much higher uh, in this type of carraginan. And then another interesting uh, fact is that while, while potassium had a higher impact in the case of kappa carraginan, calcium worked better for yota carraginan. So again, we started doing rheological measurements to, to see what was going on when, when the samples were going through the gelation process. In this case, we see only the cooling, um, the cooling ramps and uh, for the pure carraginans and with the different salts. And as you can see, in general, the incorporation of the salts had a positive effect in increasing the gelation temperature of the, of the carraginans and also in producing um, gels with higher strength. Uh, as I said before, while potassium worked better for the kappa carraginan, calcium worked better for the yota carraginan. So the next step, we wanted to understand why and what type of structures be, were being formed uh, in each case. So uh, those are SACS, uh, uh, the results from SACS experiments. And by fitting the data, we were able to uh, determine uh, the Gaussian parameter, which is related to the mesh size in the, in the hydrogels, and then uh, the correlation length uh, related to the size of the double helices. So uh, first thing that we noticed is that, that more compact and ordered structures were formed in the kappa carraginan and especially with the addition of the potassium. Uh, it, I don't know if you can see properly, but uh, in, the, in the first uh, plot, uh, we also see two small peaks, which are appearing in the case of the kappa carraginan, indicating the formation of very well ordered structures with the presence of the salt. Then in the case of the Jota carraginan, we were able to observe a more packed structures with the addition of the calcium. And in general, the, the idea is that the nature of the bridges holding together the bundles was different depending on the carraginan type and on the valency of the salt. So based on, on our rheological and scattering results, we proposed a model for the gelation mechanism 
Um, so in the case of the kappa carbaginan, we only have one sulfate group. So the addition of the of the salts, especially uh, the potassium, is able to neutralize these sulfate groups and therefore is uh, promoting the formation of hydrogen bonding between the polysaccharide chains. On the other hand, in the case of the iota carbaginan, we have a higher amount of sulfate groups so that the addition of salts is not able to, to neutralize of these charges from the sulfate groups, but uh, instead what, uh, what they are doing is creating cross bridges between the, between the sulfate groups, so that we, in this case we have an ionic cross-linking. So that's the main reason why the strength of these hydrogels is so different, because in the case of the kappa carbaginan we have strong hydrogen bonding, Whereas in the case of the iota carbaginan, we have ionic interactions. And then to show you something a little bit different, uh, these polysaccharides uh, are not able only to form hydrogels, but they can also form a different type of structures, which are emulsion gels. And in this case, uh, what we do is that we mix a uh, liquid oil, in this case, uh, sunflower oil, with a solution of the polysaccharide, which could be carbaginan or agar or any other gel in polysaccharide, we emulsify uh, the material. We can also incorporate surfactants. And as we have this emulsion and this emulsion is cooling down, the polysaccharide is gelling. So um, as they form this gel structure, the oil droplets are entrapped uh, within this structure and we have something like you see in this confocal microscopy image, which has a gel consistency. So depending on the polysaccharide that we use as the gelling matrix, we may obtain different types of structures. Here you can see some examples from agar and from kappa carraginan. The amount of oil that we can incorporate is also different. Uh, while in the case of agar, we can go up to 50% of oil. In the case of carbaginan, we can only incorporate up to 40% of oil, but this can be a little bit increased when we incorporate uh, surfactants into the formulations. So these images are confocal uh, microscopy images from, from the emulsion gels. And as you see, they have a, a more or less homogeneous distribution of the oil droplets. In the case of the agar, because it has high emulsifying properties, the, these droplets are much smaller and homogeneous. Whereas in the case of kappa carbaginan, uh, because this polysaccharide starts gelling at a very high temperature, it was more difficult to disperse the, the oil droplets so that we had a larger oil droplets and a more heterogeneous distribution. And then also, interestingly, the presence of surfactants was not very positive in the case of agar. And we thought that this may be due to a competition between the agar and the surfactant to cover the, the oil droplet surface. So that in, in that case, there was some coalescence. While in the case of the kappa carbaginan, since was, there was a decrease in the viscosity of the emulsions, it was easier to disperse the oil and uh, the presence of the surfactant had a positive effect. So again, uh, we wanted to investigate uh, the structures of these materials by small angle scattering. And here you can see some examples of Sachs uh, patterns. In the case of the agar, we basically observed that we had a very similar structure to that uh, we had previously observed in the hydrogels. So the agar double helices had more or less the same size and we had a branch network structure, which is typical from, from hydrogels. And so the oil did not have a very strong impact at this size range. On the other hand, in the case of the kappa carbaginan, uh, we had the formation of less compact ne network structures as compared to the agar. And then the, the incorporation of the oil uh, gave rise to the formation of less, less packed uh, bundles. Although the double helices had a similar size as those observed in the, in the hydrogels. And then when we increase the, the amount of uh, oil in the formulations, we observed uh, some particular structures with which could be related to the formation of inverse emulsions. 
So uh, as we have done with all uh, the polysaccharide based uh, samples, we also perform rheological experiments because we, can, we think they can add a lot when combined with scattering. And as you can see here, in the case of agar, uh, we had a two-step gelation process. A first step, uh, which we thought was related to the gelation of the agar present in the aqueous phase, and a second step, which may be related to the gelation of the domains uh, located at the surface of the oil droplets. And this was not the case for the kappa carrageen, and in that case, there was only one uh, gelation step. But then, um, interestingly, with the addition of the surfactant, uh, we have a one-step gelation process in the case of agar. So that supports the hypothesis that, in that case, the surfactant is uh, uh, located at the interface of the oil droplets, so that it's uh, disrupting the, the emulsifying uh, capacity of the agar. And then we also observed here we've marked with the arrows the formation of metastable structures in all the samples when cooling down. We couldn't find any reference on the literature to explain these, uh, these structures. And we performed several variations on the rheological measurements to see if this was an artifact or something due to the type of, uh, of um, probes that we were using, but it always appeared in, in our samples. So then we uh, decided to perform some temperature uh, result experiments on, on the Spanish synchrotron. And in fact, we observed the formation of some metastable um, structures in the temperature range close to, to the same uh, that we observed in the rheological experiments. So we think this uh, is due to some kind of chain reorganization, but we have to do uh, more experiments to try to understand what, what is going on uh, on on this process. But we thought it, it was very interesting. Nice, you have three minutes. OK, I will be very fast. So these this, uh, last slides are to show you the final application of this uh, type of structures uh, in the food industry. So. Um, uh, we have also done some, some experiments on evaluating how these hydrogels are being affected uh, when subjected to uh, some simulated digestion conditions. So that means uh, changing the pH and also um, putting the samples uh, in contact with different bile salts and other components. In this case, um, these results are uh, from uh, alginates, uh, but essentially, what we saw uh, that was very interesting is that depending on the structure of the alginate, on the manuronic and guluronic uh, ratio, uh, these structures were more resistant to the uh, in vitro digestion conditions, or in the case of the manuronic rich alginate, they lost their structural integrity uh, when subjected to uh, pH values higher than two. So, what is next? Uh, well, uh, we are currently working on the encapsulation of protein in this type of uh, polysaccharide uh, hydrogel structures. So what we would like to do now is to uh, do some in situ digestion experiments to see how the structure of the polysaccharides is being affected and also how the structure of the encapsulated protein is being uh, affected during the, the in vitro digestion experiments. So that's, that's the next step in, in this type of studies. And um, yeah, well, th these were some, some conclusions, but basically uh, I would say that as you can see from these examples, uh, both X-ray and neutron scattering techniques are very powerful tools to understand the structure of uh, these uh, polysaccharide materials. And uh, they offer us the possibility of doing some very interesting work such as in situ digestion experiments. So with that, I would like to thank my colleagues from the CSIC, Chalmers, uh, Ansto, and the Spanish Synchrotron. Uh, thank you so much, Marta. Uh, there is one question, if you can give a quick answer to that. 
And that also on Krasimir, he asked what applications to consider for the emulsion gel. What kind of applications? Uh, well, in the food uh, industry, uh, we were thinking of uh, fat replacement. So, uh, for instance, for meat products, uh, where oh, okay. you know they are looking to replace all the animal uh, fats for alternative type of fats. But also, uh, we have also investigated the application of these materials for biomedical uh, applications uh, for fat, fat phantoms in particular. So, yeah, they, they could have several applications. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. So.